the introduction. Um, as everyone just heard, uh, I'm going to be talking about using Node.js uh, and Grunt for building HTML5 build scripts. And I am going to focus primarily on how I use this in gaming, but this is actually a pretty good topic for anyone who's doing any HTML development uh, because there's a lot of really good stuff you can do with automation. So, uh, waiting for it to go to the next slide. So I won't talk too much about my background since you already had my introduction, but basically my job at Microsoft is to help people build games, uh, especially for Windows 8 and Windows Phone. And I've been doing a lot of work here in New York and helping people all over the world. Uh, and primarily I've been focusing a lot on HTML5. Uh, Microsoft has one of the only stories for publishing an HTML5 game natively to Windows 8. And it's one of the reasons I actually joined up uh, at Microsoft to become an evangelist because it's a great opportunity if you are looking to publish your games. And for this talk, I'm going to go over uh, a game I've, I've been working on. It's still a little rough around the edges, but, but ready enough to, to share a little bit more publicly called uh, Super Falling Zombies. And uh, so there's a link, uh, Bitly, there to play it. And this game pretty much is cross-platform. It'll run on desktop browsers. It'll run on Windows 8 when I publish it to Windows 8, to Windows Phone. And it'll also run on iOS and Android in the browser. So the basic idea behind this game is uh, this is a, a play on a, a game from a friend of mine, Keith Peters, who made Falling Balls. Uh, which was a very popular game on iOS and then is still a very popular game on uh, Windows 8. And his game, basically, balls fell and you had to walk around and not get crushed by them. So I changed out the balls to zombies that fall, and I added a little twist to it. So in the game, you actually have to save people. So zombies will fall out from the sky, and people will run in from the left and the right of the stage, and you have to pick them up and throw them off the screen. And also, you can use them as a shield to protect you from zombies that are falling. But the real goal is to try to protect as many people as possible. And uh, the game is designed for mobile first. Uh, there are virtual touch controls. It degrades to using the keyboard on desktop. And this is just a screenshot from the game. So you can see there's two people who are just running around. Uh, your main guy is on the left, and there's a zombie falling from the sky. And there's an arrow that indicates where the next zombie is falling. And it's really basic. You're, you just get a score for how many people you save and how much time uh, is left over at the end of the game. And then once the game is over, I do um, a little neat effect, which re reminded me a lot of uh, Solitaire on the old Windows computers where all the, the cards fell. I just have a whole bunch of zombies fall out and splatter. And I really went for a, a different art style where everything was in black and white except for the blood and guts. That's always in color. So again, a very simple game. Took me a few weeks, maybe like two weeks to build. And the whole game is built on Impact.js. So I've talked a lot about Impact. Uh, I've used pretty much most of the HTML5 game engines that are out there. Uh, and the reason I keep coming back to Impact, outside of the fact that I wrote a book on it, is because it's really all-inclusive and it gives you a level editor. It's a really solid engine. It works really well on mobile. It works great on desktop. And it's just one of the best packages out there. Uh, you know, the downside that, that, that scares away some people is that it actually costs $100, but it's well worth the money. So, you know, now that I have this game, the real thing is how do I distribute this game? And if you've seen some of my other talks, uh, I, I talk about this a lot, and this is a, a slide that I like to use where this is basically the distribution for HTML5 games. And when we look at it, there's a lot of options for it but not all of them are really that easy to approach. So desktop and browser is obviously the easiest to do. So anything from IE9 above, Chrome, Safari, and Firefox will all support, um, they'll all support HTML5 games. Mobile browsers as well, so Windows Phone 8 has a really good uh, browser and it supports you know, pretty fast rendering of Canvas. It's on par with iOS. And then Chrome for Android, I, I try to call out specifically that Chrome for Android is really what you want people playing your games in. Even that has some problems, and I've, I've had to deal with performance issues across the Android platform when it comes to HTML5 games, but it is possible to run it in the browser. Uh, then we look at things like web markets, so distributing it through the Chrome Web Store and Mozilla's Web Store and now Firefox OS. Uh, then we start getting into what I consider kind of the future of where we're seeing distribution for HTML5 games and especially apps going. 
Um, and this is WebView slash native wrappers. So things like Cocoon.js, AppMobi, PhoneGap, uh, and on iOS, especially for Impact, uh, the developer who created uh, Impact, uh, Dominic created something called Ejecta. And these allow you to package up an HTML5 game and distribute it as a native application on iOS and on Android. When it comes to Windows Store, it's actually a really easy process. You simply just copy over, as long as your game will run in IE on Windows 10, you copy over that source code and you paste it into Visual Studio and hit compile. And you actually get a full native app. So, you know, that's really awesome and it requires the least amount of work out of the, any other options outside of just distributing it by the web by uploading it to a server. So, when it comes to all these distribution channels, though, there's nothing out of the box that allows you to distribute it to all these platforms. And if you were to create separate builds for every one of them, that would basically be insane. And I really love this quote by Albert Einstein, uh, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And really, this is the, the key to why we look into how to automate things to begin with, especially in programming. Uh, I come from a long background of doing Flash development and Java development. And in those cases, I always use some sort of automation to help with my build process, especially getting into enterprise software, doing continuous integration servers and stuff like that, because you don't want to be manually building something over and over again. And, you know, we really have to ask ourselves, especially when we're getting into building a build script, is why, why do we do automation? And, and what are some of the advantages of automation? And I kind of sum them up into these three pieces, basically. So for me, for my game, I want to optimize and package up the game. Uh, it's very important to have the smallest footprint possible, so I want to combine all the JavaScript files, I want to minimize it, I want to get the artwork combined, and I want to be able to put that up because every connection that you have in your game makes your game lo longer to load, especially when you're on mobile, and you want to have the smallest footprint possible for your game. So being able to optimize the game and package it up, you don't want to have to do that all the time. The next is being able to deploy to multiple platforms. So every platform has its own distribution set up. Uh, so as I was saying on Windows 8, you need to put it into Visual Studio. For Windows Phone, the same thing. For web, you may need to just create a folder that has all the files in it and then upload that to a server. Uh, when it comes to stuff like um, Chrome's, uh, the Chrome market, you need to zip it up. So all that stuff takes time, and we want this script to basically handle all those different deployment options. And then the last thing is we want a reproducible build process, because, you know, as humans, we're prone to error, and we're also incredibly lazy, and you don't want to forget a step in the process. So when you have this automated, it'll actually just do everything for you. And once you set up this system, well, it takes a little bit of time and it's not the most glamorous work, uh, especially when it comes to building a game. It actually allows you to reproduce the same exact result every time and it gets rid of some of the insanity of actually trying to distribute an HTML5 game or even an HTML5 app to multiple platforms. So to do this, um, I'm now taking advantage of Node.js and Grunt. Uh, before I was using Ant, uh, Ant is, again, a throwback to the Java days and uh, personally not one of my favorites, but it got the job done. And since I'm already doing JavaScript and I am very familiar with the language, it seemed natural to do my build scripts in JavaScript. So, you know, when we look into Node, a lot of people think of Node as just being on the server. But one of the great things about Node is that you can run it locally from the command line and because of this, a lot of build script solutions have evolved around this process. So uh, while I don't host my games on a Node server, I actually just run Node locally, and then I take advantage of Grunt, uh, which you can find out more information about here, to actually do that. And Grunt is, you know, for lack of a better term, it's the JavaScript equivalent of what Ant is. It allows you to go through and define tasks and execute them when you run the script. Uh, the last piece of the puzzle, especially because I'm on Windows, is using Git Bash. So when you install Git on Windows, it comes with a really great utility called Git Bash. Uh, I come from, before I joined Microsoft, I come from a Mac background and a Unix background, and I really love the command line tools. So I'm a big fan of Bash. And, 
you know, not having that was kind of a stumbling block, but this will actually fill in the gap nicely. And it's much better than solutions like Sigwin. Um, it handles pathing and all kinds of issues that I always ran into with trying to get Sigwin to work on Windows. So, and it's free with the Git install. So, you know, it's just something to take advantage of and, and, and look into. So these three tools basically comprise my underlying workflow. And what I've wound up doing now is over the past few months, I've kind of perfected how to set up my project and how to structure it. And I'm not going to go into the minutiae details of the build script, but I'm going to do an overview of how I set up my projects, how my build scripts work, what I use in my build scripts, and then show you some examples that you can take a look and go through on your own. Because there's a lot of materials out there for how to use Grunt and how to use uh, that, and I'm not going to be able to cover all that in an hour. But I want to at least get your head in the game and figure out you know, how to actually tackle this for your own uses. So um, this is the basic project structure that I have. And you'll see this is, um, this is just my directory for uh, my Falling Zombies game. And in there I have um, some JSON files that represent the uh, information about the project itself. I have stuff that represents the build scripts, some config files. I have a resources folder, so that's where I put all of my textures. Um, so I, I use texture atlases, which are very similar to sprite sheets. So I'm able to take all the artwork from my game and package them up into a single image and generate out a JSON file that has coordinates for how to cut that stuff out, which I get huge savings by not having to download multiple uh, or separate sprites. So all that raw graphical information, my PSDs, my comps, all sit in resources. Also, there's some build script templates in there as well. Uh, my projects, which I'll talk about, are I have two projects that I basically work in. I'll talk about that next. And then there's other stuff that you'll see in here, which is the Node modules. So as you use Node and you install modules, it basically creates a directory for that. Uh, there's a deploy folder. So as I run my script, I'm always generating new builds to the deploy folder. And then everything is inside of Git. So in my project folder, uh, I actually have two projects. And, um, you know, outside of just working at Microsoft, um, you know, for me, I, I, I want Windows 8 to be my distribution because it's the easiest of all the other platforms, uh, like I said, with the exception of web where you just simply upload it. And what's good about that is that I actually create a Windows 8 project and a Windows Phone project. And the two projects are separate, and I do all of my work inside of the Windows 8 project. And what this allows me to do is I'm able to, one, use Visual Studio, which is a really great IDE. Um, and I can also go through now and I can manage this project, have a structure to it, have a hierarchy to it. I can go through and get code hinting. And it's just a much better environment to work. But I actually take advantage of something that, that I, I, I'm starting to coin as a web-first workflow. So I always know that my end destination is going to be Windows 8 first. Um, but the way that I actually work is that instead of hitting compile for um, in Visual Studio, I actually just do my development in my Windows 8 project just like I would any other game. I do all my testing in the browser. So I actually have my Node script will run a local server inside of the project and load up the game. I can still do all my editing in Visual Studio, but I have a browser open and I just hit refresh because I hate waiting for compilers. So for me, it's just really easy just to hit refresh in the browser. Uh, Visual Studio is my IDE. And then whenever I'm ready to actually test it on Windows 8 or Windows Phone, I just simply hit compile, and it'll load up the project, put it into the simulator. I can deploy it to a different device, or I can put it on the phone. And none of my normal workflow from years of web development has to change. I'm just keeping in mind that I know I want to be in the Windows 8 environment at the end. So I just keep working in the web browser until I'm ready, and then I test it at, you know, towards the end. So um, I'll go over real quick just how to install Node in Grunt. And installing Node is pretty easy, uh, especially on Windows. So there's just a uh, basic installer when you go to the Node website. You install it, you run it, and you're good to go. What's good about installing Node is that it comes with all of the, um, it comes with all the tools that you need to actually run it. So the most important one is this one called NPM. And what NPM is, is it's the Node Package Manager. And once you install Grunt, 
uh, sorry, once you install Node.js, you basically open up the command line. So in this case, I'm using git bash. And you just type in npm, and from there, it'll give you out the manual, or you know, the man doc about you know, that it's installed. And once you have this installed, all of the installation for modules that go along with Node and with Grunt all happen through npm. So before you really even get started with your project, you need to create something called a package, uh, a package JSON file. And the package JSON file takes care of a few things for you. Uh, first, it defines any dependencies that are in your project. And this is really key because one of the reasons why I use uh, Node now is I want to be able to give my project to someone else. I don't want to have to distribute all the actual you know, Node modules in my project. Actually, my git ignore uh, ignores the, the, the Node module folder. And then when I give this project to someone else, they simply navigate to it on the command line, hit npm install, and it will read through this project file, find the dependencies, and it will, it will basically download them all and install them for you. And this is very similar to stuff like Rake that you'd find on Ruby. And this is really useful because it means that anyone who sets up a new environment, especially if you're working on a team, can all pull the correct versions of the dependencies. The next thing that this document does is that it also contains project metadata. And you can use this metadata in your build script. So uh, I'll show you an example of it in a little bit. But it will have the name of the project, the version of the project. So Grunt will make that available through, uh, you know, through a JSON object. And you can pull that stuff out. So if you are going to generate out a zip folder, which I do, I'll take the project version number from this metadata and append that to the name of the zip that gets generated. Uh, the other thing is that um, this file is incredibly easy to create uh, via the command line. I know there's a lot of developers, especially when you're getting started, who are you know, kind of nervous working on the command line. Um, as long as you don't like, try to reformat your entire computer, it's actually pretty easy to get around. And there's a lot of great tutorials on how to use Bash out there. Uh, it's been around since the dawn of computers. I mean, it's forever. But you know, once you get past a few of these commands, and in this presentation I kind of highlight what the commands are so you can have a reference, it's really easy to, to do this on your own. So the command for basically creating this project file is to just do npm init. And when you type that in, you're actually going to get a wizard. And the wizard's going to go through and ask you your name, the project's name, what version it is, where the GitHub repo is, It'll tell, you know, it'll ask you if you have any testing. It'll ask for a description. So you basically just follow through that. Once you follow through, you wind up with a package file. And this is kind of the overall anatomy of the package file. I don't know how well you can read it on the slide. For me, it looks like it's a thumbnail, so I can hardly read anything. Hopefully, on your guys' end, you see it a little bit better. But, you know, for the most part, what you see is at the very top is the beginning metadata you need, like the name of the project, the version, like I talked about. Uh, any reference to this being on GitHub or wherever you're hosting the Git project. And then towards the end, you'll see that there's a dependency uh, object. And that dependency object has every single pr uh, dependency of module in my project folder. And what you'll also notice is important that it actually retains the version number. And that's pretty key because then you get the exact version that you need when you want to set up the project again. So once you have that sort of set up, the next thing to make sure you do is that you have the, the Grunt command line tools installed. And this is what we call a global installation. So there's two types of installations from NPM. There is global, and then there's project local. And you can tell the difference because it has a dash G in front of the name. So here we just do NPM install dash G Grunt uh, CLI. And what this allows you to do is run Grunt files uh, and build scripts from the command line. So and um, I put open, these are all, all these projects are all open source. There are two, repo there are two places where you can get them. Uh, there's an NPM uh, website that lists out all the modules that are available to you for just anything in Node. And then I also wanted to make sure that you had the GitHub project so you can see, because I think it's really important that, you know, if you're a JavaScript developer, uh, it, command line stuff or even some of the build script stuff might be scary at first. But I want you to see the GitHub repository, because if you start digging into it, you'll actually notice that it's all just JavaScript. 
And that's incredibly powerful, especially if JavaScript is your main language, that you can start learning how to build your own modules for your own build scripts. So next up, I'm going to talk about the grunt file. So in order to actually have a grunt build, you need to have something called the grunt file. And the grunt file handles three main things for us. It handles loading modules. So all the modules I just showed you that I have a dependency on, we need to load them up. And this should be very familiar to you if you've ever done anything with Node. You load up the modules so that they're accessible. Next, you define the tasks. So everything is broken down into a specific set of tasks. Do you want to copy a file? Do you want to rename a file? Do you want to replace text in a file? Every one of those is a specific task that comes from a module. And from there, you define the actual instructions for that task. And then the last are a set of task runners, which allow you to string together groups of tasks. So let's say I want to copy an HTML5 file over to a folder. I want to rename the paths to the minified version of the JavaScript file and then I want to compress the JavaScript. I would have a task that, I would have one main task that ran that, that went through all the little tasks and linked them up together. So, uh, so what does the grunt file need to do? So I, I went through and I kind of just outlined at a very high level what my own build script does. And I put it up on GitHub, there's just a gist of it uh, up there, and you can take a look through it. It's still a little rough. This is my own build script. I mean, the, the beauty of build scripts are that they're not designed to be pretty. They're designed to be functional. But I wanted you to be able to check out this link and at least go through and see it at the state of when I did this talk. Um, but here's the process that I need to go through in order to actually create a deployable game. So the first thing I need to do is I need to copy all the source code from, um, to a temp directory in the deploy folder. So uh, this is something that you did a lot in, in, uh, in the ant days. Uh, you don't ever want to work directly with your own files, right? You don't want to corrupt your files. So the first thing you ever do is copy your source code and all the files that go along with it into a temporary directory. And I put that temporary directory into my deploy folder. And in this temporary directory is where I do all my work on all the files. This way my main project never gets touched, right? And you'd be very surprised. Copying files over, modifying them are incredibly fast, especially in Node. So, you know, it's, it's, it's very good to be able to just keep track of copying those files over, modifying them somewhere else, and then getting rid of them when you're done with it. So the next thing I need to do is I need to combine all of my JavaScript files into a single JavaScript file. So this is a pretty standard uh, procedure. Um, there's a lot of utilities out there that will help you do that. Impact is unique in the fact that it has a very custom module structure. So in Impact, you actually have to make use of a PHP file that will go through and combine all the game's um, modules into a single minified game. Um, so in this case, I differ a little bit where I have to use a command line to talk to PHP in order to run the file, um, which again is something really great that Grunt will do, and I'll show you uh, the plugin that does that to talk to the command line uh, on, uh, for PHP. But basically what I want to do is combine or concatenate all of my JavaScript files into a single file. The next thing I do actually was a blessing in disguise. When I started building out the Windows Phone build for a native Windows Phone app, I quickly discovered that the XHTP request doesn't work on local files. There's a security block on it. So I had JSON files that represented all the texture atlases that were in my game for my artwork. So I couldn't load them locally on Windows Phone in, in a C-sharp wrapper. So what I wound up doing is just saying, you know what, I'll just inject all that JSON into my actual game. So I use basically a find and replace where I'll load up all the JSON files that are external to my game. So these could be configure options. These could be um, levels. Anything that's external, I basically put that into the game where it belongs uh, through this build process. And what's really great about this is that in the next step here, I uglify the final JS. This is just a this is a library that'll go through and it, it minimizes it and it, you know kind of obscures it a little bit. Um, but what's great is that all the JSON data that would have been uncompressed before now is included in my game. I don't have additional loads, 
and it's all being compressed. So my, my, minimum, uh, my minimized JavaScript file for my game is incredibly small. I actually should have taken a picture of it, but I usually get about a 50% savings on something like this. So this is huge if you're loading mobile games online, especially you don't want to have to be loading in a whole bunch of extra JSON, uh, JSON files and then parsing them and dealing with that stuff. Uh, the fifth thing I do is I delete uh, source code and tools from the temp directory. So there's a, that PHP file that I was talking about that comes with impact. I delete that directory. I also delete the library files or the main source code of my game. Now that I have the minimized one, I don't need any of that anymore. I just use the minimized game. And then the last thing is that I actually perform the builds. And the builds for each platform, I'm going to go into them a little bit later in the talk, but I'll take this temp directory and I'll copy it over to a web build for say, uh, per se, and then I'll modify that for whatever the web build needs, and then I'll copy the temp directory over to the Windows 8 build and vice versa down the chain of all the platforms I want to deploy to. So you could see how doing something like this manually would be you know, a real big pain in the butt. So that being said, you know, I take advantage of a lot of libraries. I really love the fact that uh, NPM makes it incredibly easy to pull in any type of library that's out there publicly and also manage it. So I'm going to go through basically every single library dependency that I use and talk about why I use them so that you have a point of reference of, oh, I want to do that in my own build script. Let me look at this one and I'll take a look at that. So the first thing I do is um, I have one called Express. And Express is a local server. Uh, it, it's a lot to run for, for something simple like this, but what's interesting about Express is that I'll have the Express server run inside of my Windows 8 project. And since my Windows 8 project is comprised of JavaScript and an HTML file, and I'm doing my web first, uh, my, my, my web build, um, I can actually go through and just run it right from my browser. And I set it up as a local host, so I have like a port 880 and it'll just load right from my Windows 8 project. The thing you'll notice about this installation is the npm install express dash dash save dash dev. So that last part, I, if you remember back to what I was saying, that there's two types of ways of installing uh, node modules. There is global, which is what we do for the grunt command line tools. For something like this, though, I don't want this to be global. I want this to be saved inside of my project. So by doing dash dash save, not only will it load the module into a node modules folder inside of your project, but it will actually modify the package JSON and include that as a dependency. So that's really important. And what's even better is that I actually keep all of my development um, in SkyDrive or you can keep it in Dropbox. And any computer I go to, it actually, since it has the node uh, module uh, built in uh, into the folder, I can actually just be up and running. I don't have to download anything. Everything kind of stays in sync by using one of these cloud storage solutions. So, you know, the dash dash save is pretty important when it comes to installing these modules. So the next one up is uh, Grunt Shell. Uh, what this allows Grunt to do is it allows it to talk directly to the command line. So like I was saying, in Impact, there is a dependency on a PHP script for baking the game, as he calls it. Uh, I actually can just have Grunt directly talk to the command line. So it's, it's really powerful because you can do a lot of stuff. You can have JavaScript basically create directories and stuff right from the command line if you're more comfortable with Bash, uh, for example, on the command line. And, and it works great on Windows. Uh, and of course it works on, on Mac as well. Uh, the next thing I use is something called uh, Grunt Contrive Watch. And this one's a really interesting one, and this actually is the entire backbone of, of my build process. This allows you to watch a directory for any changes, or more importantly, you can watch a particular file by an extension name if there's a change in it, and then it can run something. So for an example, anytime I make a change, I actually have to reload the server. So instead of me having to manually reload the server, or forgetting that I didn't reload the server and I'm not seeing my changes and I'm trying to pull what's left of my hair out to try to figure out why it's not working, Grunt Contrive Watch will actually just sit there and watch a directory for me. Uh, I'll get into this a little bit later, but when you're using stuff like TypeScript, 
uh, or even if you just want to automatically be generating out minimized versions of your JavaScript or your CSS or SAS or whatever you're doing, you can just simply watch for .js files or .ts files and have it compiling it constantly every time you hit save. So that's an incredibly powerful one, and one I don't think I could make any of this work without that one. Uh, next is Grunt Text Replace. So I use this a lot. Um, I, when I copy over my source code to the temp directory, it's going to retain the paths between the, all the JavaScript files that I've been using that were separate. So in my case, I have an, I have an inclusion for, um, for Impact's library. I have an inclusion for my own Impact games. I have some other libraries like resizing stuff to handle resizing that are all separate script tags. What I do is when I copy that over and I create the minified JavaScript and I combine all my JavaScript into one, I actually use replace to go into that index page, rip out those script tags, and I actually put in a new script tag that points to the minimized file. So this just uses regex. Um, I also have some builds, which I'll talk about a little bit more, that will replace paths, so URL paths. Let's say your deployment server is different from your testing server, so you may want to replace the paths that are correct for your deployment server and have separate ones for your testing server. So those are just some things that you can do with replace. Um, it's also really good that if you wanted to include a version inside of your game or somewhere for debugging, you can actually read your package JSON file, get the version from that, and inject it into your game. So uh, Grunt uh, Contrib Clean, this allows me to clean up directories and, and, and just uh, clean up stuff as I go along. Not much special to, to this one. Um, grunt, uh, grunt Contrib Uglify, again, I was kind of talking about that, but it will basically compress the JavaScript and kind of obscure it a little bit. Um, so this is useful to have. I mean, at the end of the day, you have to keep in mind, especially for HTML5 games, is that it's JavaScript. Um, it's not very hard to look at the source code and figure out what's going on. This does a little bit to make it more annoying, but, you know, it, it, I really use it primarily for getting rid of all the white space and for getting the smallest file size possible. Grunt Open. This is uh, the last one that I'll talk about. I think there's like a few more I still use, but you know these are the, really the high-level one. What's great about Grunt Open is I'm building a web app, and when I run my build script, I actually want it to open my browser for me automatically. So this allows you to open up any URL from the, from the Grunt script. So at the end, when I start up my server, I run open, and I open it to localhost colon... Uh, 8080, and then I can play my game right there. So I'm, I am that lazy that I don't even want to actually worry about opening up the tab. And of course, if the tab's already open, it's not going to open it again. So that's a really good one as well. So I'll talk about how I actually run this build script. So by default, if you navigate to the root of your project where your grunt file lives and you type in grunt, it's going to run the default um, command, whatever that one is, is designated. And in this case, you can kind of see it's running through a few things. And what my default does is that it starts up the express server. And then from there, it automatically loads up my game. So here's my game in IE, so I can start doing, excuse me, I can start doing my testing. And I also have it load up my level editor. So I have two windows open, so now I have everything I need to actually start working. And this is, again, what I was talking about with Impact and why I love Impact so much is that it has its own built-in level editor. So now I have my level editor and I have my game open, and all the development I need to do in the web browser is ready to go. The second part of the Grunt script is a command called bake. So um, this is something, I just gave it the arbitrary name of bake. It's a play off of the fact that the PHP script that needs to compress the, uh, the impact game is called baking as well. And what this does is it goes through and it performs all the tasks I talked about before. It creates the temp directory, it copies things over, and then it goes through and it does each one of these builds. So the first build that I'm going to get is a web build. And literally it just copies over whatever was in the temp directory after everything's been compressed and optimized, and it puts it in a folder called web, and it's ready to go. 
and this is good because all the paths are relative. You can just kind of dump this anywhere. Uh, it's even great like if you just wanted to throw this on Dropbox just to test it out real quick, you can do that. Um, you can even have Grunt copy this instead of into the, the, your deploy directory. You could have it copy it to a Dropbox folder, or you can even have it copy it or FTP it directly to a server. There's a lot of really interesting things you can do, you know, if you're if you're trying to get even more advanced with this. Uh, the next build is uh, very similar to the web build, and I call this the uh, the hosted build. Um, I think in my build script is actually called the blog build. But I I host my game on my blog, and my blog is run by WordPress. So all the files in WordPress actually relate to slash wp dash content slash game slash name of the game slash media where I can get all the images from. If I was to take my web build and put it on my server, it just wouldn't work because of the routing inside of WordPress. This automatically packages up the game and replaces all the paths uh, from relative to absolute based on my server. So I, I, I highlighted over there with the, the, the new uh, F12 tools in IE11 uh, just so you can see kind of the, the path change. And again, it's, it's a very subtle thing, but it's incredibly helpful, especially when you're you know, trying to host this game on like a WordPress site, which I highly suggest doing, by the way, because it's, it's just a great way to get you know, a game up and running really easy and creating a blog post about the game and just hosting it from, from a blog. So the next build is going to be my Windows 8 build. So before I even can hit compile, I actually have to run the build script, because what will happen is that since everything already lives inside of my WordPress, uh, sorry, inside of, inside of my uh, Visual Studio project, all I really need now is the minim minimized JavaScript file. So the build script just simply goes to the temp directory, copies the minimized JavaScript file into the JavaScript file of the Visual Studio project for Windows 8, and then when I hit compile, I have everything I need. And Visual Studio is set up to ignore the lib directory where I do my development, but it looks for a minimized JavaScript file. And the default HTML in there is also pointed to the minimized JavaScript file. So this will just copy over that, and it allows me to have my Windows 8 build up in almost no time flat. And then I have a Windows Phone 8 build. And so the Windows Phone 8 build, uh, there is a default HTML5 template that comes in Visual Studio. Um, and what it allows you to do is it has a C-sharp wrapper for a web control, basically, which is kind of like a web view. And it just points to loading up whatever the index file is inside of an HTML folder inside of the project when it gets packaged up. So I simply copy over the web build, or what would have been the web build from the temp directory, into my phone project, and then I'm ready to run the game on Windows Phone. Uh, so and this actually works really well. It performs incredibly uh, well on, on even like the low-end new Nokia phones that are coming out, the, the lowest-end ones, uh, all the way up to the high-end phones. So, and I've gotten it to work where it, uh, because it's still a web build and sound is still tough on different, uh, on different platforms, Windows Phone will support a single audio channel. So the game is smart enough to know that it's running on Windows Phone. It only plays the background music. Uh, and over time, I'm going to continue to fill out uh, some features. I can, I can actually get better sound support by routing sounds from JavaScript to C-sharp, which is kind of what PhoneGap does uh, to bridge it on there uh, on other platforms. So that's something you know, else to consider, but something I have uh, planned down the line. And the last of my builds is a zip build. And um, I don't have this fully working in the, uh, the, the one that I put up on GitHub. I have a few experiments of this. But this one's a really powerful one for any store that requires you to zip up your game and submit it through that way. So the Chrome Store, Firefox OS, uh, Cocoon JS, and AppMobi all accept a zipped up file. So what happens is that the build script will generate the, uh, the manifest JSON file that each store needs, uh, along with the artwork or whatever else it needs, and then you'll have zip files for each one of these platforms. You can simply upload it through their tool. So again, this is incredibly powerful because you can create all the zips that you want for each platform and take advantage of different distribution channels. Uh, I was also playing around uh, just recently with um, Amazon just released an HTML5 packaging tool. So same concept, you have to upload a zip and you have to have a manifest. So this could easily tie into that as well. So um, that's kind of a high level of how these build scripts work. 
the, the real key about any build script is how to actually make it modular. So I want to be able to reuse this build script over and over again, but as you can tell, there's a lot of things like the name of the project, um, the padding for my blog for that game, all that stuff is kind of hard-coded. So one of the ways um, that I've been getting around it is by using a configure.js file. So again, you know, what's great about Node and Grunt is that it's just JavaScript. So I have a JSON, uh, a JSON file that has an object in it that tells me the name of the project. Um, uh, this is from another project, um, but you get the kind of the idea. Uh, it, it has the path to it, it has the path to where it needs to go on my blog, um, and all this information. And then in my grunt script, before I even start running the grunt command, I actually create a variable called config, and you can read JSON files locally uh, through, through grunt. So you just do grunt.file.readjson, and it'll turn that config file into a JSON object. And I can use that variable anywhere throughout the, the, the build script. So that's incredibly powerful, and it's one way to make your, your build script more modular. So now I can just simply copy that build script to any project I have, and I just need to add my own configuration file to it. Uh, the other thing that I do is I spend a lot of time breaking down tasks into very small tasks. So um, there's actually a lot of different tasks that, that, that run, but the three main ones are um, build platform, uh, so build for my platforms, I actually have it build out the web view, the phone build, the blog view, the Windows 8 uh, one, and that's one task. And then you know, before I even do that task, I actually need to do a few other things, right? Like I need to copy the temp directory over, I need to run the shell script to optimize it, stuff like that. So you'll see here in my bake command, I do that stuff, then I reference the build platforms in the middle of it uh, or, or towards the end, and then I do my cleanup. And so what's great about this is that I can reuse that task. So the next thing I'll talk about is a, a debug build that I have where I actually don't remove a lot of the, uh, the, the source code and I don't do a lot of the cleanup. I just simply copy the source over to a particular project. And you see here that all I'm really doing is I'm just creating a temp directory and then I create the platforms and then I do the cleanup. So thinking very small, um, small tasks and chaining them together to build much larger complex tasks so that you have a lot more reusability. So the last task I wanted to talk about was my debug task, and this happens all the time, right? If you're going to minimize your JavaScript file, it's very hard to debug minimized JavaScript. So what I wind up doing is I'll actually have a build here where instead of it minimizing it and compressing it, it'll just copy over the whole source code over to a particular platform. And then I can do my debugging that way. When I fix my problem, I can go back and I can put that in my main project or I can just work for my main project. And then from there, I can go back and do the minimize and try to test it again. So making sure that if you're ever doing compression of JavaScript files or any of that stuff, make sure that you actually have a debug task because that will bite you in the end as well. Uh, it's happened to me so many times and that's why it's the first thing I make sure I have is I start with the debug task and then I start with the, the production minimized version. So uh, some real world workflows. Um, this, I've been working on this for a very long time and I have a bunch of, of blog posts and things I've talked about in the past, but I'll throw them up here real quick. I'm not gonna spend too much time on them, but here's an example of a case study I did uh, for a game called Heroin Dusk uh, on Windows 8. And it basically shows how I ported uh, this game um, by, uh, by a developer named Clint. Uh, he did this for one game a month. It's a really great point-and-click adventure. works perfectly on mobile devices. And I ported it over to Windows 8 in about 10 minutes. It actually took me five minutes to get it up and running in Visual Studio. It took me another five minutes to create a grunt build script. So if you look at this blog, it goes through how I took his project, cleaned it up, added a build script, and then automated the process of de being able to deploy it to the store. Likewise, I took the same process, and once I had that build going, I was able to take the same stuff that was generated in that project and make a Windows Phone app out of it. So again, same thing, not as robust as what I was kind of showing off from my zombie game, but still, again, very quick process. It doesn't take very long to build, uh, to do these build scripts, and they save you so much time, especially if you're doing heavy development. Uh, the last thing I want to kind of get into is TypeScript. And, uh, 
TypeScript is a really great language. It's a, it's a language that Microsoft is developing. It's basically a typed version of JavaScript, and it uses a compiler to generate out JavaScript. But unlike stuff like CoffeeScript, you don't have to learn a whole new syntax and grammar. Uh, you actually, it looks literally just like JavaScript. You can actually mix JavaScript and TypeScript together, but it actually, it'll take advantage of if you're using an IDE like Visual Studio, type correction, inference, all these things that you get from strongly typed languages. It also allows you to do interfaces and you know, scale up your, your game, uh, your, your code in a lot better way. One of the things that's great about TypeScript is that you can actually use uh, Node.js as the compiler. So I've set up a lot of things for Grunt, basically running automation builds for my TypeScript. So the, a really great library that's coming out, it's about to hit version 1.0 is Phaser. This is an awesome HTML5 game framework, um, especially because it, it, it's built in TypeScript. Uh, it's one I'll be talking a lot about uh, in the future, and it's built on it's built on the same principles as a game framework in Flash called Flixel. Uh, it's created by Richard Davey, um, and you can check it out here. Uh, so if you're interested in doing TypeScript development for HTML5 games, I would highly suggest checking out this framework. Uh, again, uh, to get people started, I wrote a very basic project template that uses Node and Grunt to automate building your game out. So this is a, a reference to the project template for it. And also, if you want to learn more about the actual framework, uh, I wrote this post just um, building a very simple game with Phaser. I really love using my zombie artwork. Um, basically, the zombies has come out and you shoot them, but it goes over the basics of showing sprites, animation, collision detection, all the things you'd need in a game. Uh, I will be updating this post when version 1.0 comes out. There's a lot of changes that are going on with the TypeScript compiler, so um, this may not work necessarily with the latest version until 1.0 of Phaser comes out, but it's still a good read to go through and see how things are structured, and I'll be updating this post over time. So, um, you know, well, you know, I'll just talk really quick about why I created this workflow. Um, you know, I've been doing a lot of development lately in the HMFI gaming space, probably like the past two years now, and I'm spending a lot of time on this one game a month. Uh, so I think I talk about this in every one of my talks. One game a month is awesome. It's really about just making a game, and it doesn't have to be perfect, doesn't have to be polished, it just has to be a game, and do it each month, and just trying to get that out the door. But one of the things that is difficult is I want to be able to distribute that game, you know, all over the place. So I came up with this kind of workflow as I kept working through my games. Um, I also, again, I'll go through this real quick, but the last slide will show you um, where, you know, the link to this deck so you can get these links. But I'm starting to build out these what I call starter kits. So I've taken three of my better games over the past uh, year of one game a uh, month and I'm turning them into starter kits. So all you need is a copy of Impact, and you work through this workflow. This is all kind of built into these starter kits, and it'll let you take one of my games, customize it, and it shows you how to build a game for Windows 8, Windows Phone, and you can host it on Azure or whoever your server is, but getting it up and running. And over the, 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 the rest of this year, I'm going to be polishing these up and cleaning them up uh, and talking a lot more about them. So, you know, this is a really good opportunity that if you want to see kind of how I make games, some of the code's still a little rough. I'm still cleaning it up, but I have three different starter kits. Uh, this other one here is uh, Super Resident Raver, which is a platformer one. Uh, again, very rough, and I have links to where they are on GitHub, but I'm going to be moving them into a, a different repo very shortly uh, as the fall, uh, as we start getting into the more of the fall and I start teaching them here in New York. Uh, and the last one is one I, I, I talked about a lot. This this one doesn't use the full workflow already, but if you watch the videos, it gives you a good insight into how I build my games, how I use Impact, and this actually uses my old Ant build. Um, I have a branch for the new stuff. I'm about to push it out uh, very shortly, but you can even go back if you're into Ant. You can go see how I was doing this stuff with Ant before. So I, I wanted to keep that one in there. And. You know, finally, for people who uh, live in New York, or if you're making a trip to New York and you're here over the weekend or on a Wednesday, I run workshops here in New York out of uh, Microsoft New York office, uh, basically teaching people game development. So 
I have a really good lineup that I'm working on for the fall. I have these starter kits. I'm going to be doing some phaser stuff as well. I have Unity uh, evangelists coming out to talk about Unity. So there's a lot of activity going on in New York. I'm really working hard on helping the local New York indie game developer community grow. Uh, if you want to be part of that scene and you've not made games uh, before, you're looking to make games, there's that. I also, every Wednesday night, run a studio time out of our office where I basically just invite a very small group of people. I have it capped at 20, and I let people just come out to our office and make games. And you can make games on whatever platform you want. I'm just happy to help people make games and see what they're doing. And it's really great because people actually wind up helping each other, and it's a really good environment. So that's every Wednesday night here in our office. And that concludes my talk. I think just on time, with enough time to get some Q&A. And, and again, at the bottom, I hosted, um, I hosted the, uh, the slides online. So if I went through that a little too quick or you want this as a reference, please go ahead, take a look at the slides, and I'll be doing some more uh, posts about this workflow, uh, especially as I get more into phaser development uh, on my blog. And my blog has tons and tons of articles about game development, uh, app development, you know, a, a lot of that stuff. So definitely check out my blog. And thank you for listening. Great. So we'll go ahead and go into Q&A. It was an excellent presentation, Jesse. Um, from Rick, he wants to know, what's your opinion about Unity game environment? Uh, so Unity is a really great uh, game environment. I, I jokingly call it the new flash of game development. Um, and Unity is something I'll be doing a lot more of. Uh, I've, I, I've had so much stuff invested in HTML5 right now that I'm still building a lot of my games in HTML5, but I'm, I'm slowly working my way into the Unity stuff. And we just had a, a very big partnership with Unity. So if you are a Unity developer, uh, there's a contest going on until the end of September to publish your Unity game for Windows 8 and for Windows Phone. Uh, I think the prizes are like up to $100,000 in prizes. And especially if you're a Unity developer and you're local here in New York, please reach out to me. I'm happy to help with getting people test hardware, uh, especially for phones, helping them get set up with Windows 8. Uh, so, you know, Unity is a really great environment, uh, and it's one I hope to be talking a lot more about in the future, in addition to the HTML5 stuff I've been doing. All right. And Nico would like to know if you could talk about automation without games or apps. So um, automation without games or apps. Um, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, you can use automation for almost anything. I mean, even if it comes to like writing scripts for batch, uh, batch renaming files on a folder. I mean, you know, for years I used Python and, and other, you know, simple scripting languages. But uh, this might be overkill. I think the, the real advantage of, of Node and Grunt is really for uh, JavaScript development. Uh, and like I said, the key advantage is like, if you, you know, just like when you did Ant, if you knew Java, you can write modules for Ant. If you do JavaScript, Grunt and Node make a lot more sense because you can write that stuff in the language that you're more comfortable with. And Chris has a question. I've been reading a little about Yeoman. How does Yeoman work with Grunt? Yeoman is a really interesting project. Uh, I was looking at it early on when I was building this, and they didn't have support for Windows at the time, but I know that they just hit 1.0. It's on my list to look at. Yeoman is very similar to something that would like generate uh, structure for you, similar to like how Rails would generate um, scaffolding uh, for your project. So you can use Yeoman, to the best of my knowledge, to, to you know create templates or create you know, code artifacts and stuff like that. Um, I haven't, like I said, I haven't dealt too much with it because it wasn't fully cross-platform at the time. But it, it's something that I think as I get more and more into the phaser stuff that I want to do, I'll probably take advantage of something like that because I want you to be able to, from the command line, say, new project, and it will generate out a project set up for you automatically. And somebody would like you to explain Bower. Um, I don't remember what Bower is off the top of my head. It sounds familiar. Um, I'm doing a quick 
Bing search to find out. Um, yeah, I don't, I, there's not much I can talk about it because I don't, I actually haven't used it, so sorry. It looks like Bower is a JS package manager. But I was just looking at. I, I'd have to look more into why to use it over, you know, this, the, the built-in stuff for N, uh, NPM, but all right, something else to add to my, my never-ending list of, uh, of things to, to play around with. Uh, Yale would like to know if if you know nothing about HTML5 game development, what are books for beginners that you would recommend? Is that where I get to um, selfishly plug my own Impact JS book? But you know, there, there's there's a huge amount of of books out there on on HTML5 development. Um, I would definitely go through and look through the O'Reilly stuff or check Amazon. Um, the the book that I wrote basically goes in the beginning of how to take, you know, a blank impact project and create a side-scrolling uh, zombie shooter from it. Um, again, it has a dependency on impact, so if people are willing to spend the money on the book and a copy of impact, it's well worth it. Um, but, you know, the best thing, honestly, if you just want to kind of get started is make sure you have a good understanding of the underlyings of what HTML5 games are about. like using JavaScript and understanding how Canvas sort of works and picking a framework that will give you the most deployment options. There's not many of them will support web very well. I'm sorry, mobile web very well. Um, so just figure out which one you want. And I mean, the internet's a wealth of information around that, but you know, I think my book was good if you want to try that one out. We agree. Uh, Yale would also like to know, do you need Windows 8 to develop Windows 8 games, or can you use Windows 7? Uh, you need Windows 8 to publish a Windows 8 game. So uh, on the workshops that I do on the weekend, again, I'm a big believer in cross-platform development. I you know, invite anyone, who, whatever computer you have, to come out and build an HTML5 game. Um, from there, once the game is done and ready, you know, I showed a workflow for how I do it inside of Windows 8 and Visual Studio. You can still build an HTML5 game and either get a VM for, um, get a VM for, uh, for running Windows 8, um, or you can purchase a Windows 8 computer and do your final build. Or, you know, depending where you live, you know, we have lots of evangelists throughout the country and throughout the world, and we're always running events, and a lot of times we run events or we have locations where you can come in and set up an office hour with a local evangelist and at least test out your game, talk about how to port it over, and you know if you don't have access to that. Because a big part of it is also making sure you can test on the right hardware, like a touch screen uh, versus you know, low-end hardware versus high-end hardware and stuff like that. And Rick would like to know if Phaser costs as much as Impact JS. Phaser is 100% free and open source, which is, is one of the, the, the most uh, appealing parts of it. It doesn't have a level editor, and it's still um, being battle tested um, and going through some changes. But the only real dependency you can you can actually do JavaScript development, just straight JavaScript development with it. But if you want to take advantage of classes and, and, and you know stricter structure. You, you have to use the TypeScript. So there's dependency on the TypeScript compiler, which is still uh, a work in progress. And Christian would like to know, with Grunt being native on JavaScript and all JS-related build tools, is this the only benefit compared to Ant? I have no other major point when arguing with colleagues. So Ant is very procedural and doesn't allow you to do inline programming very easily. Uh, what's really great, like even for Ant just to do basic conditionals, you have to load in a specific library and, and it starts growing. With, with, with Grunt, what's powerful, like I said, is you know if I want to load in a config file that has variables in it, I can simply just load in that JSON file and then anywhere throughout my Grunt file, since this JavaScript just referenced that, File. Or I could do JavaScript calculations 
before the tasks even run that set up what the environment should be like. So let's say I wanted to find out the count of files. I could do all that ahead of time, but I can, all write, I can write it all in JavaScript and just take advantage of Grunt and Node's ability to talk to the local file system. So that's a huge advantage over something like Ant where you're stuck in a very hierarchical XML structured based task uh, executor and it's incredibly limiting to do anything more complicated than just procedurally run through one task after another. Jesse, we have a lot of questions left. How many more are you willing to take? I'll, I'll sit here and answer whatever questions. This is, this is what I do for a living. Excellent. That's what we like to hear. Um, so Fado would like to know, is Git Bash necessary for the Windows platform only? Do you need it for Mac, OS X, or Unix, Linux environments? Um, you, can, you can just use the regular command line DOS or whatever on Windows. This is how, like, I'm, this is where I'm not a good Microsoft evangelist. I don't, I don't normally use the, the normal command line or um, on other platforms that's sort of built in, right? So OS X uh, and Linux are all Unix based command line tools. So Bash is built in. So that's why Git Bash only comes on Windows. It's only part of the Windows install. So, um, you know, if you don't want to use that, you don't have to, but if you come from a Unix background like I do, it's, it's kind of a lifesaver. And Mark would like to know, where can you find a list and description of Grunt plugins? I believe on the Grunt site they have it. Um, I, I kind of work backwards. Whenever I go to do a build script, I'll write it out in English of like literally every step of what I think it needs to do. And then from there, I'll search for Grunt copy or Grunt minimize. And you know, from that search, I'll usually find the plugin. With Grunt and Good Monitor Text Editor and other tools, why do we still need a Visual Studio? Um, so, you know, I switch back and forth between a lot of IDEs. Uh, I really like Sublime Text, uh, you know, it's just a simple text editor. Uh, Visual Studio is primarily for if you're going to build a Windows 8 or a Windows Phone app out of it. I mean, like I said, I mean, in addition to me being a Microsoft evangelist, I want to be able to distribute my game in a store, and I want to be able to monetize it in a store and not have to jump through a million hoops like throwing it into PhoneGap or relying on a third party to package it for me. Um, so because I know that Windows 8 is going to give me the best experience for deploying my game, I tended to start for that, and in order to do that, you need Visual Studio. But there are free versions of Visual Studio for it, so there's Visual Studio Express for building Windows 8 and for Windows Phone apps. Um, but you could just as easily do this in a text editor and, um, you know, or another editor that I highly recommend is WebStorm. Uh, you can forego the Windows route and just go straight for a web build or uh, use something like AppMobi uh, or whatever App, uh, AppMobi is becoming now that it, it's been purchased by Intel uh, and use their tools so you're not tied into Visual Studio. I just, I think Visual Studio um, with this plugin called ReSharper is perhaps one of the best development environments you know I've ever used. So that's why I use it. And I get paid too as an evangelist. Uh, Christian would like to know how mature do you see Grunt, i.e. how fragile is the task API and refers to a recent switch to multitasks that broke a lot. Um, I've only been using Grunt for a little bit and uh, I've, I've noticed there's a few changes throughout. I've been looking at it over, you know, for a while, going back and forth whether I wanted to use it. Um, you know, here's the thing with open source. Um, you know, it could change at a moment's notice. I think the, the most important part is that since NPM and your package JSON file manage the version of Grunt that you use, you know, you're safe. Right? I mean, each, pro each project is set up as its own little island, so you can still use an older version of Grunt and not have to worry about it versus something else where maybe, you know, they do an update and you're totally, you're totally forced to update everything and it breaks, you know, it breaks your whole process. 
So I'm less concerned about it, but you know, like any open source project, there's no real roadmap. It's being, you know, it's, it's people are donating their time to build it, and you know, it, it's as fragile as as that's always going to be. Scott P mentions I was introduced to HTML5 gaming through Construct, and would like to know. Or excuse me, Construct two. And he would like to know your opinion on using Construct2. So Construct2 is a really great platform, especially for getting started. It's drag and drop, um, being kind of OCD about, I mean, as I just talked for an hour about how I build custom build scripts, and I actually enjoy that. Uh, Construct doesn't give me the level of granular detail that I want when it comes to making a game. But if you're just getting started, it's a great place to to do it because you don't have to worry so much about coding. Uh, it also supports Windows 8 and Windows Phone, so that's that's a good plus in my book, and, and also outputs to other platforms. But you know, I think if you're getting started, uh, Construct 2, if you want to get a little bit more power um, and have some ability to code, I would highly suggest looking at something like GameMaker. GameMaker has an HTML5 output. It has a native output as well. So when you do GameMaker, you don't have to deal with as much of the issues as you would from HTML5 distribution because GameMaker would deploy a native iOS, a native Android, a native Windows and Windows Phone. Um, so, but and then if you want to get to the web, you can still deploy a web build. So, you know, I, I tend to lean more towards GameMaker than Construct2. Deca wants to know what you think about Stage 3D Air for mobile games. Uh, yeah, I don't know what I should say about it. I mean, it doesn't seem like a lot's going on with it. I know some very successful indie developers who are still using it. Um, it's sort of viable, but I think the real benefit of HTML5 games over something like that is that you still can't play Air in a browser or Flash and Stage 3D in a browser. And I think with the, our recent announcement of IE11 supporting WebGL, uh, WebGL becoming the standard for 3D on the web, and the performance in it is pretty, pretty incredible, uh, and more mobile devices are starting to support that as well, I, you know, I see that as becoming more of a standard. Great, and we just have three more questions here. Um, Brent had mentioned uh, you dumped desk in Windows 8 phone. More comments of the related tasks, please. I, I what? I dumped? Looks like Where's the, uh... you dumped desk to Windows 8 phone. Oh, I, oh I, I ported desk to Windows phone. So about how, how that worked, I guess that's the question. Well, I'll, uh, I'll talk about that process. So, so heroin dusk, I'm assuming this is what the question is. Um, how I ported it to Windows Phone. So um, I, I saw the game and I, I got in touch with the developer of the game and asked him if I could write about it. And basically I took his JavaScript game, put it in the Visual Studio, put all of his JavaScript files into another folder and just kind of cleaned up the structure of it, used Node and Grunt to basically take all of his JavaScript, concatenate it in, in the correct order into a minimized JavaScript file, and also output a web build. Uh, so whenever I ran the build script, it would generate the minimized JavaScript for a Visual Studio project, and it would create a, a, a deploy directory with a web build. And then when I wanted to get it onto the phone, I used the HTML5 template for the phone, and I simply just copied over the web deployment to the phone. So it's basically the same thing I talked about through my Falling Zombie game. Um, this one's just a very simplified process, uh, just to show how quickly it took me 10 minutes to get that whole setup up and running. Hope that answered that question. All right, and Tony would like to know if there's any investment at all to build, publish Windows 8 games. Um, the investment obviously would be a copy of Windows 8. Um, we, we have some really great programs that are, you know, that actually help indies and startups. They're designed specifically startups, but I've been using them for indie game developers. 
uh, called BizSpark and DreamSource. Uh, so BizSpark, uh, BizSpark and DreamSpark. BizSpark is for businesses and DreamSpark is for students. But the basic idea is that you sign up if you're approved, you actually get free copies of our tools uh, over the course of I think it's like three to five years. And from there, you can actually get everything you really need to do the development. So if you qualify for either one of those programs, you can get that stuff for free. It also is a 90-day corporate trial or uh, enterprise trial for Windows 8. So theoretically, in three, you know, in in that trial, you can build out two games or whatever and just try it out. And if you like it, or if you're doing good, you know, you, you can go out and purchase a full copy of Windows 8. The other investment clearly is going to be the you know, develop, uh, the fee for becoming a developer. So for Windows 8, it's a $50 fee. If you're an individual, it's $100 if you're a company. And for phone, I think we're running a special where it's like, it's, it's really reduced right now. I think it's like 16 bucks. I don't remember off the top of my head what it is. Um, but there's a, there's a discount going on for phone right now. So, you know, just like any other platform, the real barrier of entry is going to be the price for becoming a developer, the operating system, and whatever testing hardware you need. I would highly suggest having some sort of um, touchscreen device or touchscreen itself in order to touch, uh, in order to test touch. Because in Windows Store, we have one OS that goes across desktop to tablet, and you need to be able to support touch as well as uh, keyboard or mouse input. And a lot of my games actually use Xbox controller, which, which is, is relatively easy to set up as well. Okay, and last question. What is the difference between Grunt and GuardJS? Um, again, I have to defer that one. I don't know GuardJS. I feel like, I feel like there's, a, there's a, a running joke where there's more HTML5 game frameworks than there are HTML5 developers, and I feel like the, kind of the same thing is going on with, with Node build scripts. Um, I, I'd have to look it up. Unfortunately, I, I, I haven't used that. I just... I think I, I found Grunt. It did as much as I needed at the moment, and I just kind of went with that. But I'll, I'll add that to my list as well to look at. So I'm always looking for, you know, a better wheel. All right. So that will conclude our webcast. Uh, thank you so much, Jesse, for your presentation. It was well received, and we had such a great audience today. Um, do you have anything you'd like to leave the audience with? before we close. Thanks again for the opportunity, and uh, I'll be doing more of these talks over the next few months. So I'm you know, looking forward to continuing to teach you guys HTML5 game development and hopefully do some Unity stuff. And you know, if anyone is interested in learning more, please you know, hit me up on Twitter. Uh, at, uh, at just, I'm just Jesse Freeman at Twitter. And I'd love to help anyone out who's making games, especially if they're, they're being built for Windows 8 and Windows Phone. All right. Thank you so much, Jesse, for joining us today. And thank you all for um, joining in on this event. We hope to see you at future webcasts. And um, just a reminder, we will have this webcast archive up within 48 hours. So um, thanks again. Have a good morning or a good evening or a good afternoon wherever you're from. Goodbye. <laughs>